And we're live. Hi, everyone. It's your friendly ex-Muslim, Abdullah Samir, joined by your other co-host, Abdullah Gondal. And we have a special guest today, Alex. So today, we're going to be talking about Aisha, the favorite child bride of Muhammad. Now, he was her she was his favorite according to Sunni sources. So we're going to be doing this based on Sunni sources. I guess maybe there's some, I don't know if we're going to go into Shia sources or not. Uh, Abdullah Gondal, over to you. How's it going with you and Alex? Hello, welcome to another episode of the Two Abdullah Show. And today with me, here's Alex. Hi. How are you doing? Good, good. nervous, but good. It's her first time live, so uh, that's that. We're going to be talking about a very interesting topic. Uh, the scandals of Aisha. Uh, the whole plan is going to be a multi-episode series. It's going to cover a broad variety of topics from her life relating to Muhammad and the caliphs. But today we're going to just focus mostly on the controversy surrounding her age and glance over some of the details and the clues in the text, which end up leading to uh, this idea that Islam doesn't have any legal age for marriage. And then you can Certain sheikhs say that there's allowance for marrying little babies and whatnot. So we'll go into the nitty gritty, into the details, the scandal surrounding Muhammad and Aisha's marriage. But the whole series, just to give you a glimpse, apart from the marriage and their age, is going to be when Aisha was accused of cheating on Muhammad. Uh, Aisha actually openly expressed her jealousy towards other wives. Sometimes, uh, actually, do you want to tell them that story when she broke the plate? Oh, yeah. Uh, a wife brought over, sent over a plate, and Aisha was pretty jealous about it, so she smacked the plate out of the slave's hand, and it broke and fell into pieces, and uh, Muhammad forced her to send over uh, one of her good plates to the wife with a really good dish on it. Yeah. Justice. And, uh, <laughs> And Aisha would also uh, be jealous of Zainab and the other wives. And uh, I think Hafsa and Aisha got together and accused or were mad at Muhammad for having uh, intercourse with his sex slave. And then the, Aisha used to taunt Muhammad. And she actually used to say that your Lord hastens to fulfill your desires. because She was jealous as to how many women Muhammad was uh, having sex with. And that... Um, she would actually spy on Muhammad sometimes. So Muhammad would run off to the graveyard at night. And then uh, what else do we have? Yeah, so uh, they actually ended up in the Quran. Allah threatened them. And uh, then there's the whole breastfeeding uh, adults thing that Aisha did. And then she fought Ali, the fourth caliph of Islam. And now according to some, some Shia sources, they say that she poisoned Muhammad. And there is some evidence for it in the Sunni, even in Sahih Bukhari, I believe, where Muhammad was forcefully given medication and he freaked out. And he actually had all the people in his house take the same medication because he thought he was being poisoned. And then the next day he died. Yeah. It's quite a serial drama right there. Lots of uh, <laughs> on in the family of Muhammad. And, but I guess that's to be expected when you had such you know, reckless relationship with, you know, multiple women coming into his life um, repeatedly. Like, I, you know, I just remember the top of my head that there was an instance where she actually said she saw Muhammad look at a woman and she knew this is going to become his next wife, right? And so this was something that, you, you know, she had to, like, deal with in her life that this man could have up to unlimited wives, just like, you know, David Quraysh or one of these uh, cult leaders, they just like, you know, whatever they want, they get, right? So unfortunately to the women in his life, Aisha maybe in some ways was luckier because she was a favorite wife of Muhammad. So she enjoyed some benefits from that, right? I mean, being able to lead an army against Ali, um, I don't know if any other wife would actually have that privilege to get away with that, but uh, she managed to do that. So yeah, do you want to get into the slides now? Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> So the comment earlier about uh, uh, she being the favorite character. So actually, she's one of my favorite characters, too. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point we're doing this is because through her lens, you kind of get a different perspective in Muhammad's life. And I think that's refreshing. And 
and quite controversial at times, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, mm -hmm. so first we'll start off with the slide about who she is. So she is Aisha bin Abi Bakr. She is the daughter of Abu Bakr, the first caliph of uh, Islam. And she was actually, for those who don't know, the third wife of Muhammad. Now, something I want to mention about how she ended up uh, getting married to Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad lost his uncle and then his first wife, Khadija, who he was married to for about, I think, 25 years to that point, and was monogamous with her. And then this was the year of depression. And then as soon as she dies and his uncle dies, a couple months later, he marries Sauda and then Aisha right after when she was six years old, right? And Muhammad was 50 at the time. And she lived with uh, Muhammad for nine years. Marriage was consummated at nine. Uh, an interesting fact is that because she was Muhammad's youngest wife uh, and also his favorite wife, Muhammad spent a lot of time with her. Uh, one of the things, because of her young age, her memory was fresh, so she ended up narrating people, say, 2,000 plus hadith. And I think she's one of the largest hadith narrators after Abu Huraira. And that gives her a very high standing in Sunni Islam because there's so much of what uh, Muhammad did in his private life that we uh, learned through her. Do you want to uh, talk about some of the things? Um. <clears throat> Well, uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about is how he um, how he decided to want to marry Aisha, which is the next slide. Um, uh, he was uh, very sad. He had just lost his wife and uh, his uncle. So he had a dream. Do you want to read the hadith? Yeah, so I'll read the hadith. Uh, Aisha reported Allah's messenger having said, I saw you in a dream for three nights when an angel brought you to me in a silk cloth. And he said, here is your wife. And when I removed the cloth from your face, lo, oh, it was yourself. So I said, if this is from Allah, let him carry it out. And in the second hadith, it repeats the same thing, but it says she was shown to him in the dream twice. Now, it's very interesting that Muhammad is 50 years old and he lost his, uh, his first wife, his uncle, a year of grief. He's very depressed. Muslims are in like this exile kind of thing in Mecca. He has no protection. And then he sees these dreams and uh, suddenly he interprets them as revelation from God and decides to marry that six-year-old child. Because of a dream. Yeah. Because a dream told him that he should marry a six-year-old. Do you <laughs> understand how chaotic the world would be if like, we just took decisions based on our, the dreams we had mm -hmm. at night? I just... It's not just that. Like Muhammad also had a history of having like these dream interpretation things going on. Because like you see the story of Joseph mentions that he had these dreams. Abraham, he, he almost killed his son because according to Islam, he had a dream and... <laughs> so murder, child marriage, what else? Absolutely, yeah. Dreams? This is actually a dream a dream saga here. Yeah, this could be another series. <laughs> yeah, dream yeah. series. <laughs> do you want to talk... Do, do we touch about... Uh, do we touch on the age issue at all? Do you want to just talk about that right now or no? Covered later. I think I think it's gonna come up in a in a sequence sequential way, so we'll do it there. Okay. So so basically he had a dream, and um I remember Hamza Yusuf saying that this is his justification that it wasn't Muhammad that wanted to marry Aisha, it was Allah that was giving him a dream <laughs> to tell him that he should marry Aisha. It wasn't even his choice. I mean, what did he have to do with anything? It was a, it was from Allah, right? That's that's the sort of justification I've heard about this. Yeah, his subconscious definitely has nothing to do with it. No, I think he, exactly like he, either he was uh, delusional and in interpreting the dream like that, or he never had a dream. He was just weird, and he just, he just actually used it as a con man technique, right? Like anybody could claim anything and be like, "Oh, God told me in a dream." 
how easy is that? Yeah. <laughs> and oh, and even, what about the the fact that this was his best friend's daughter, right? Oh, we're gonna talk yeah. about that. Later. Yeah, uh, <laughs> right after. Yeah. It comes up in a very awkward way because Muhammad does not return the favor. Mm. That's all I'm gonna say for now. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Yeah. This one is about how did Abu Bakr react? Reluctant. Now, if so, you notice, you want me, let me read, let me read it. Um, yeah. Prophet asked Abu Bakr for Aisha's hand in marriage. Abu Bakr said, "But I am your brother." The Prophet said, <laughs> "You are my brother in Allah's religion and His book, but she, Aisha, is lawful for me to marry." Oh my God. It sounds so culty right yeah. there, just like using God. <clears throat> His and... best friend was like, "You're my brother. That's weird. Like he, that's weird." Yeah, that's weird. You're that's kind of weird. weird. He was being respectful, but he was saying that's weird. That's super weird. <laughs> yeah, he's basically and... saying no without just saying no to his face. But it's interesting yeah. how it was actually preserved this hadith, right? And the funny thing is, look at look how Imam uh, Bukhari interpreted it. So this this is a secret to to understanding hadith that was taught to me uh, as a Muslim. The chapter heading I know they call it chapter heading. It's not chapter heading. It's basically a hadith heading. Is the interpretation of Imam Bukhari about what this hadith is regarding? So this hadith is all about marrying a young, <laughs> an old man. <laughs> Damn. Like specifically a Explicit. young woman to an old man. It's specifically a young woman. To it's, not, <laughs> it's not hiding it at all. Like there's there's no hiding it. He's oh, also man. calling Muhammad an elderly man. <laughs> 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 it's funny. He's not he's not a young man. He's not a middle aged man. He's an elderly man. <laughs> Bro, at that point he had was how many kids with Khadija and like they were in their teens. Yeah, that's gonna come up. Too. She was younger than his uh, kids. Yeah, yeah it's gonna, uh, by, it's a lot. by a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody had an issue with this, right? Back then. Uh, <laughs> we'll come to that too because uh, there are uh, instances where surrounding civilizations definitely had legal age in their constitutions from hundreds of years before Islam hired by a few years. So, but not definitely. In not in where Muhammad was living. Or if 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 there were people who had issues with it, they didn't mention it. This was probably mm. common in Arabia. Hmm. Do you think? No? I don't I don't think I find a lot of examples of women being this young at being married off to such elderly guys. Because you'll see that in a few slides there will be a chapter that will talk exactly about the marrying the person to the like the same age group as well. Okay, and, so let's, then. let's let's get to yeah. That. Let's go forward. Yeah. Okay. So right now we are just gonna confirm uh, the deal that how old was Aisha? Now the problem is like a lot of people uh, recently have come up with the idea that Aisha was very much eighteen or nineteen, and that there's no Sahih hadith, and these are all fake. But if you actually look at the the details like there's hadith in Bukhari, Muslim, and all the six books, and many others, and not just from uh, Aisha herself, but narrations from uh, uh, people who met Aisha, the Tabi'in, the companions, they all said that, yeah, she was young. And this was never an issue according to Muslim history for majority of, if ever. Uh, so that's one thing that you see Aisha explicitly herself tell that she was six when she was married and nine when she was consummated. Now, Sandra, could you point out the chapter? Uh, Alex, can you point out the chapter headings? Yeah, exactly. Giving one's young children in marriage. And then the other one is, okay. Is it permissible for a father to arrange the marriage of a young virgin? So specifically children. So, yeah, so pe people were saying that this is all wrong. It's not just the hadith that's wrong. It's also Imam Bukhari's understanding is wrong as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing to, to, to mention here is that Aisha being a child 
if it was okay back then, that doesn't make it okay today. It doesn't make Muhammad any more and like um, a man of all times because he was engaging engaging in activities that are problematic, right? That we know are problematic. We have good reasons to believe that it's problematic, but he did it. So now the question is, you're going to have to decide, is this a problem or is it not a problem? If it's a problem, then you have to say that what Muhammad did was wrong. If you're going to say it's okay that what he did, because it was in that time, now you're using moral relativism. You're saying that the values can change over time. And nobody say, says that about Muhammad because Muhammad is a man for all times, the, the prophet for all of humanity forever and ever, right? So that that's a... That's a catch-22 situation there where you have to figure out which one is it. Is it wrong or is it okay? And and that's why many Muslims today will actually defend it because they're like, well, Muhammad did it. So I have to defend it. I have no choice but to defend it. And now that's where they get stuck. And that's why now the age is changing of Aisha, right? Because that, that's the whole get out of the jail cut. She wasn't even, she wasn't a child, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's the whole, that's how I got into Islam. Like, I somebody told me like oh no like don't worry about those six and nine hadith like that's that's not true speaking of that did you know beforehand about any of this did you ever hear about this before you joined islam no not like not that she was this young no i knew that she was young mm -hmm. i <clears throat> but not this young mm -hmm. um from what the like muslims in my circle were telling me was that she was uh 18 that's really lucky for them right? and when was the first time you came across these these hadith well when the first uh, probably like a few months in like after i had converted mm -hmm. like i didn't i didn't know and then um i i was already in so i just made an excuse like oh well uh, the hadith you know oh, okay whatever <laughs> But like, yeah, if, I, if I you would have known beforehand, you, no, you would not have joined. No, film? okay. Is seriously, if I would have known beforehand that he married a six-year-old, I would not have. No. Wow. Okay. So it is a deal breaker for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. 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 Marrying a six-year-old is a deal breaker. <laughs> no. 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 Totally. We've yeah. said it here today. <laughs> but it's too late. By the way, the one way, <laughs> right? You can't. Yeah. You know, it's too late. <laughs> No take backs. Uh oh, <laughs> it's kind of like you know, converting to Islam is like making a deal with the devil. Once you make that deal, <laughs> there's no going back. <laughs> you, you stuck, you signed your soul away, and you gave it. Now it's like we'll break your legs if you leave the gang. It's kind of like the mafia. You don't have to talk to you. You want to stop selling drugs? You want to clean up your life? Oh no, you're not gonna do that. You're gonna mm -hmm. give drugs to me. You're going to do this or you'll see what happens to this person in your life and this person that you'll care about and see what happens to you. You end up dead in the gutter, basically. So Islam is like, I mean, we've made, made that reference before, but it, that is what it is. It's a one way <laughs> hotel, California. You check in. You, never... <laughs> you can't check out. <laughs> hotel, California. Oh, Not the evil, man. So another thing before we keep going, I wanted to point out was that the argument isn't that Muhammad himself was fixated on pedophilia where he kept marrying children where he had like this over urge to just marry kids. He wasn't that kind of a pedophile. The idea stems like his sexual behaviors can be explained through a different uh, perspective of uh, his mental health and other things that we will explore in different uh, projects. But uh, he had phases of hypo and hypersexuality, and we have people who suffer from certain neurological conditions go through these phases. In fact, you'll see certain cult leaders have these visions, these dreams, or hear voices from God, and then they'll go marry children or go rape kids. Warren Jeffs. There you go. There's one name. That's my favorite. Right? So there are modern-day cult examples, too. Uh, and uh, without going into too much detail, is the manifestation of how Muhammad firstly married Aisha, the dream and the delusion from that, uh, I think stems from that. And then also how uh, <clears throat> after like uh, marrying her, how the whole consummation thing, and then it comes into this 
this marrying children thing, because the problem is Muhammad isn't just uh, a man in history. Uh, to Muslims, he's the prophet of God and the best example for all times to come, right? So even though Muhammad wasn't a pedophile per se, or he, his actions of marrying a young child leads scholars like Imam Bukhari to consider child marriage and these kind of things halal. And as you will see that, there is no legal age in Islam. And we will show you books upon books where some people, some of the scholars explicitly said that Aisha was actually prepubescent when all of this happened, right? There's so no this minimum age, you mean? Exactly, yes, yes. Yeah, they make it very, very clear. They get all the hadith, like they make sure to record that you can marry babies, like you can marry whatever. Okay, well, let's move on to the next slide. So this one here oh, wow. is very, very interesting because we got to give a little bit of a background. So in in the bottom part, you see Quran chapter 65, verse 4. Now this verse talks about the idda, meaning the period where women can't remarry after a divorce. Uh, so they know that if they're pregnant or not, right? But the idda, this waiting period, is only applicable if the marriage was consummated, as uh, in another place in Surah Ahzab. Now, in this verse, it says, it talks about women who have their periods. And it says, for women who have no courses, i.e., they are still immature, their idda is also three months. Remember that idda is only applicable if you consummate the marriage. And when you're applying an idda to girls who haven't, had their periods because they're too young, you're also implying that you can have consummation with prepubescent children, right? Now, this is not me making this up. If you look on the top left side, Imam Bukhari interprets this exact verse to mean, literally, he takes the verse, and he inserts the verse, and then he says that this is about the three-month idda of the kids before puberty before adolescence. So he's being explicit and he uses the marriage of Aisha to Muhammad at the age of six and consummation at nine to think that, okay, this fits the prepubescent uh, sexual intercourse criteria. This is uh, surprising. I haven't read this. Um, like I, I didn't notice this before, this, this part in Arabic. It's interesting that it's not translated, right? I mean, unless it's giving one's young children in marriage, but that 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 misses a part before adolescence or before you know they, mm -hmm. they right? That part's not really yeah. there. Mm -hmm. and I I posted a link. Um, I posted a link in the comments that has a little bit of a, you know, goes into a little bit more detail on this wall sixty five four and gives references to the tafsir. Um, talking about basically there's, there's two opinions here. Uh, Muslim, some some Muslims will say that 65 4 is talking about those who can no longer menstruate, meaning when you divorce a woman that has a that has no more period, this is what you do. But the tafsir makes it clear that this was the gut, and even the as um asbabul nuzul, the, the reason for revelation is recorded that basically someone came to Muhammad and said like in the case of me marrying a woman that has not yet had you know a period what how do i divorce her what's the waiting period so it's clear from the hadith that this is and the, and the tafsir that this is regarding um a woman not not an old woman that doesn't have periods but a, like a a child basically right hmm. and if in if you look on the right side top right that screenshot is from uh, Tabari's history the 40 volume work and I think this is from volume 8 and Tabari himself writes as for Aisha when he married her she was very young and not yet ready for consummation so this is Tabari who was a 10th he died in like 923 or something 921 something around that year and he is saying that no Aisha was too young when she was married to Muhammad, he was too young for consummation, meaning she's prepubescent. And but she's old enough to be a wife. Hmm? They're talking about when she was six. 
Yeah. 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 Which is why he waited. This is what some people say. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he determined that six was too young and nine was okay. That's weird. Like, <laughs> exactly. Like, how is this? Is something we have to get a talk about too, where there's this weird perception in the in these Muslim apologist circles that as soon as you start bleeding, it's like a switch. You turn from a child to an adult. <clears throat> It, it doesn't work like That's that. That's not how it works. There are so many phases and so many developmental stages in human body has to go through, right? And he actually, we'll talk about maternal mortality later as well. <clears throat> Let's go to the next slide. Ooh. This is about the infamous dolls Aisha used to play with. And Aisha also playing with children. Now, what's disgusting about this is that if you look on the left side, is the, the name of the chapter. It says children and subchapter says stroking a child's head. And it's talking about when Aisha used to already be with Muhammad and she used to play with dolls, right? And not only does it mention that, it said that when her friends would come over, Aisha used to play with other kids. They would hide from Muhammad, so the kids would see Muhammad and run away because they were probably scared of what he was doing to their friend Aisha. They're terrified. Right? <laughs> and there's some other hadith where he would come in, they would run out, and he would run. He would go out, and they would run away into the house from him. Uh, I don't know if we can imply that they were scared of him. I mean, I, I like... I know a lot of young kids would run away because they're shy or because, you know, it could be the culture where, you know, they don't feel comfortable because there's an adult, adult, <laughs> an adult mm -hmm. man coming in the room. So they want to, the kids, they're going to run away. They're going to hide. Doesn't mean they're necessarily scared of him. Mm -hmm. um, but unless, unless you think that is implied here, uh, that they were hiding from him because they were scared. <laughs> Because no, it sounds, no, not directly. Hadith, it sounds like he he called them and they played with they played with him too. So, you mm. know how romantic he's playing with kids. He's playing with <laughs> friends, his playmates. His playmates. <laughs> his playmates. Uh, see, that's the thing. It's not implied at all, like you said. But it's kind of like disgusting that he's playing with the same <laughs> children. Oh, it's just gross, honestly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> On the right side, though. Uh, one thing I want to point out is in the footnotes, in the brackets, it says that the playing with the dolls and similar images is forbidden, but it was allowed for Aisha at that time as she was a little girl not yet reached the age of puberty. So this is from Hazrat al-Asqalani in Fath al-Bari. Now this guy is a leading commentator, uh, this uh, scholar of hadith, and he says that after consummation, she still, when she was with Muhammad playing with dolls, she still had not reached the age of puberty. And he's saying that he's implying it from his own deduction. So that is a very Again, interesting... Again, letting her at six, not necessarily nine, right? No, this is nine because she's in the presence of the prophet and she's to go and all that. And this continued because you'll come to some other hadith where she then says years, a few years that even after that she was an immature girl. Okay. Next slide. Do you want to say something about the playing with dolls? I mean, uh, I don't know any mature women playing with dolls. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I could always find like exceptions to the rule, but generally, when yeah, you think about of the course, there's exceptions, but uh, no, <laughs> there's just no. Uh, Why would they preserve this detail? What do they want to demonstrate about Aisha? Yeah, that she's a kid. Right? She's right? playing with kids. She's playing with, she's dolls. playing with dolls. They just want to reinforce that. Do we see child. some uh, some other women in Arabian culture that were very old and mature and that playing with dolls was used as a, a trait to show their maturity? Was Aisha playing with dolls with other wives? That's actually a very good question. <laughs> was Aisha playing with dolls with other wives of Muhammad? Probably not, because they were old and taking care of stuff. <laughs> they had adult things to do. <laughs> oh, man. 
you want to just address this comment uh guys please try to understand there's nothing wrong with early marriage 1400 years ago uh as abdullah gondal was saying there was actually this was not actually like this huge age discrepancy is probably the most extreme like example of age discrepancy with with like a nine year old and a, how old was he In 54 his, at consummation yeah, yeah. So it's it's like it's quite an extreme ex, you know discrepancy, and even if it was okay back then, the point is we're pointing out that this is not okay. Period, and the fact that Muhammad did it, if he did it, and and this is why we you know Abdul Gondal is bringing all of this evidence to show that she was indeed actually a child, for a grown man to marry a child that plays you know, and this is all the evidence that we're showing. This is a problem this is actually an issue right so that's that's why we're, we're highlighting this not <clears throat> you no know, we understand that this was a common thing back then but then what is muhammad a common man if if that's what you're saying i'm not you specifically but if if muslims are saying he's a common man okay then we have no problem with that he's just another <laughs> another old grumpy old man that did stupid things and we should have looked at him at a, as an example for anything if that's the case then we're, we agree right <clears throat> yeah, we can definitely look at him at, through a historical viewpoint if that's what you want. But then a lot of stuff goes out the window. Another few points I'd make about the marriage that it doesn't make sense even from a logical perspective, even in the seventh century. Okay. And uh, Muhammad will agree with me because he used that same <laughs> reason to project his daughter being married off to an old guy. We'll see this. It's a hilarious it's an issue. Why did Muhammad, if if marrying early was so common, why did Muhammad himself firstly wait till the age of 25 only to marry a widow that was 40? Then, uh, secondly, the other issue is that <clears throat> it doesn't make any sense for getting a young child married to a guy who's in his 50s in an era where life expectancy isn't the greatest. So you're setting the child up for basically a relationship that is very unlikely to last long because the guy's going to die pretty soon. And when the guy will die, the family will be left without a dad, most likely, because the wife is going to be too young. Okay. She'll have two, three kids, but then the guy is going to be 60 and he's going to be dead soon. And if it's so common, then why just one? And one of the other interesting why things. Why does he have not more child brides? Is before Muhammad. And before Islam, we have civilizations upon civilizations who recognize that too early of a child marriage is actually very dangerous to women's health and the women themselves because maternal mortality, i.e. women dying during childbirth, was a leading cause of death in women sure, throughout ever. history. <laughs> and the younger you are, the harder it is, right? So those civilizations actually had higher ages stipulated like 12 14 15 and some certain points 600 years before islam was around yeah and that was like the legal that wasn't the norm exactly and well we also see that if you do look at the cases in history we see this one thing uh is that the big leaders that did marry these very young children they were also not the norm they were the exception like these king that was 50 or 60 and married this 12 year old girl in the what 15th, 16th century, mm -hmm. he wasn't still the norm. He was still the exception to the rule. Yeah, exactly. That's interesting. And he yeah. wasn't a prophet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a lot of times we miss out on this on this fact, especially Muslims, especially me as a Muslim and Muslims in general, miss out on the fact that the Middle East. Mecca was not the whole world at that time, meaning that like the things that happened in Arabia in many cases were actually way behind the rest of the world. For example, mm -hmm. some of the scientific understandings of the time in were much more advanced in Greece, right? Like the Greek scientists were way ahead in terms of some of the laws that in terms of some of the, the laws for women's rights and in terms of, you know, free slaves you know treatment of slaves all of these things are actually in some cases better than you'd find in islam even though it's before islam islam was not revolution islam has some things that are 
revolutionary. I don't know, revolutionary. Maybe that's the wrong word. Progressive. For example, Zakat. Zakat's great. I mean, you can't complain about Zakat. But at the same time, there's like so many awful things in Islam that are just but ugly and just awful. Mm. And just, you know, behind the times. Even at that time, it was behind the times. You mm. know? So, um, yeah. Now, uh, another thing what we'll see in the next slide, and I'll let you, <coughs> you actually found these things for me. Oh, yeah. uh, the oh, yeah. <laughs> highlighted part there. So this is the hadith on the left side. You see from Sahih al-Bukhari when Aisha was accused of cheating on Muhammad, right? And then Muhammad goes to ask a few people what they think of Aisha. And Barita, Aisha's slave girl, uh, says this about her. Uh, yeah, that she is a girl of immature age who sometimes sleeps and leave the dough for leaves the dough for the goats to eat. <laughs> <clears throat> so she just her own flavor really called Now, <laughs> interesting tidbit. Remember the goat eating the Quran? This is in a different hadith, just magically Randomly. coincides that Aisha used to be clumsy with the goats. <laughs> She just left stuff out <laughs> to be eaten. Maybe, maybe she did have to the goat, right? Maybe it's like a pet. <laughs> 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 the goat of Aisha. Right? The, they'll, they'll, feed my, they'll feed the cats like food they're not supposed to and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the kids, right? Yeah, kids yeah exactly. Exactly, yeah. But that's exactly what she said. But this is happening after. Muhammad is married to her and they go to this far away her place and her necklace is lost and she's accused of sleeping and whatnot. And the scene is pretty intense. Like if you look further down, they accuse the person and they're like, I will uh, chop your head and this guy will chop your head. And they're like ready to chop off heads. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this now, is the whole thing about you know, whether she actually cheated on Muhammad. This was the mm -hmm. whole investigation going on, right? Yeah, people are crying, and then Muhammad fainted, and suddenly the revelation came to him <laughs> later on. Very convenient. On the right side, though, again, you see Aisha um, saying herself that I remember the messenger covering me with his rida, like with his shawl, while I was watching the Ethiopians playing in the masjid. And masjid came in Medina while she was living in the masjid with Muhammad until I got bored. And then Aisha says, so you should understand the keenness of young girls to play. So Aisha again tells us that she's a young girl who likes to play. And in another hadith, it's the same kind of hadith, but just narrated in a different book. It says that uh, she was looking and he would stand there for my sake till I was the one who departed. So estimate the time a young girl eager for amusement would wait. Uh, so that's Aisha again saying that she was young and she would like to play like girls and the dolls and whatnot. It's sad, it's sad yeah. Mm -hmm. Good points. These are all very good points and very difficult to, um, because you wouldn't you wouldn't call a nineteen year old woman a young girl. You'd say a nineteen year old woman, right? A young young implies not nineteen is like an adult basically, right? Yeah, you can say young adult. Yeah, for nineteen year old. Young woman too for that, but not it, young girl. It doesn't. No, you wouldn't say young girl, right? You you might. Yeah, no. You might say something else. Young woman, maybe, but young girl, no, like not not nineteen. Hello, little girl. Imagine you said that to a nineteen year old. They'd be like looking at you, like. <laughs> <laughs> or like my. Even my but son. do we see? Do we see any of these details recorded about other wives of Muhammad or that were mature old women? That would keep telling people that, oh, I was so keen and I was so young and I like to play on swings and dolls. And she just she didn't get to have her child. With it. And another exactly. And another thing that we need to keep in mind is we need to stop thinking about the idea of like the bleeding. Just forget about the bleeding because you need to understand that the bleeding is a, a one step in a bunch of steps that. The lady has to go through maturation and years of maturation. Her hip bones have not widened. If she had, gets pregnant, she will most likely not be able to have the baby through natural birth. And she has a huge chance of dying. 
and whatnot, right? And even just being pregnant and then, is a risk for them at and that age. Forget about the physical. You have to think about the mental. Biologically, it is impossible for a six or a nine-year-old girl to have the maturity of an adult or something we would consider of an acceptable level of maturity to understand marriage and what sex is. You just you just can't expect that it's impossible. Neurological development takes so so long. Right. And it's like I said, we have to think of her from her perspective. Imagine she's a girl who's young and she's telling you her stories about her childhood that was spent with this guy. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and it's he, kind of morbid. She's scratching his clothes and shit. To, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, scratching the skin off his clothes. Uh, when you said she didn't have a childhood, she also didn't have um in a way she didn't have an adulthood either because she no, never exactly yeah. an old man this old man died and he made her you know basically ha- never get married to another man ever again so that's another thing like she had to stay you know basically be like a monk after he died right she could never have sex again she could never love another man she was just stuck in being this like the widow of muhammad right this child bride. maybe that's why she's okay. the only like, wife of muhammad that keeps narrating these scratching hadith and all these weirds because she's frustrated in her later years so all she can do is just think about the good old days oh my gosh <clears throat> right <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right so continue next one was fatima too young um chapter a woman marrying someone who is similar in age to her okay it was from abdullah bin bureda that his father said abu Bakr and omar may allah be pleased with them proposed marriage to fatima the daughter of muhammad so abu Bakr and omar being his closest companions wanted to marry muhammad's daughter but the messenger of allah said <laughs> she is young what? Then Ali proposed marriage to her and he married her to him. So he wanted a young man for his daughter, not an old man like him. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So how common was it that he wouldn't even marry his own daughter to an old man? Yeah. And it's a Sahih Hadith. And the funny thing is, if you look at the figures, when this happened, Abu Bakr was about 50 years old, 50 plus, and Omar was 40 plus when they proposed. And this is, cons- and then she married what uh, Ali at in 623 AD or something. And on the right side, there's just a mention that Shias and Sunnis have a disagreement about her date of birth, where Sunnis say she was born in 605 AD. And she has said that she was born five years after prophethood, 615. And then there's some Shia Sunni scholars that both agree on other dates. But I just left it on the right side there. Uh, But yeah, one opinion holds that she was nine years old. She was born around the same. She was born around the same time as Aisha. And so that would make Ali 23 to 25, something around that. And he was proposing to a nine-year-old and he married her off. And he was not okay with the nine-year-old marrying Abu Bakr, who was 50, or Omar, who was 40. Now, the other calculation would mean she was 10 years older, so she was 19. And oh, that makes the case worse, because then Muhammad is refusing a 19-year-old marrying a 40 or a 50-year-old, saying that, oh, no, a 19-year-old is too young for you guys. But he's okay with being 50 and marrying a six-year-old. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. All right, so next slide. Yeah, this one you will. Mm. Okay, <clears throat> fun fact. Muhammad married Aisha when his own daughters were much older than her. Uh, Muhammad's daughters were in their late teens and 20s when Muhammad married the six-year-old child. So let's see. So uh, Muhammad married Aisha in 1619. So... Uh, Zainab was 20. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. and it just keeps going, yeah? So Zainab was uh, was 20 years old at the time of the marriage. The other one was, I believe, 
18 and the one after was 17 or 16 years old at the time Muhammad married the six year old. So imagine you being 20 and your dad being 50 and then you going to your dad's wedding who's marrying. Dude, no, no. They could have had children. Muhammad's his grandfather's age, man. Yeah. He it's so could messed have, up. Yeah. Aisha could have been his grandkid. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> wow. This is interesting. Okay. Do you want to talk about this? So this is from, is this from uh, Reliance of the Traveler? Which book is this? Yeah, this is from Reliance of the Traveler. It's like a very famous thick uh, manual, very reliable. Now on the left, uh, bottom, the highlighted part stipulates that a guardian may not marry his prepubescent daughter to someone for less than the amount typically received as marriage payment, nor marry his prepubescent son to a female who is given more than the amount typically received. So at the end, it says either case is if you do get the right amount, you are allowed to marry off prepubescent children. And this is the problem that I was coming back to is because Muhammad married the Aisha at such a young age, it creates, even though he wasn't just focused on marrying kids and dealing with kids or he wasn't like a classical pedophile, it's still because he's claiming to be a prophet creates this thing where hundreds and thousands of years later, people are still writing books advocating child molestation. You want to read the second one? <clears throat> yeah, which pretty much says the same thing. A waiting period is obligatory uh, for a woman divorced after intercourse. Whether the husband and wife are pre prepubescent, um, have reached puberty, or one has and the other has not. Intercourse means copulation, just to be precise. <laughs> Uh, if the husband was alone with her but did not copulate with her, then divorce her, there is no waiting period. So again, prepubescent, they make it very clear, you're allowed. And it's the same as using the 65-4 uh, theory too, where, you know, they're saying the idda period and prepubescent children and then Imam Bukhari and so many hadith and most of these scholars said that, yes, it's because the were said that you can consummate with children who haven't menstruated, i.e. prepubescent. But this is just, it's just so sick and dark to see that it, this all trickles down because Muhammad did the thing at first, right? It's the origin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just opens the door to abusers, to mm -hmm. abuse. I'm just going to read one of the comments because it's kind of interesting. Uh, a strong opinion of both Sunni and Shia scholars is that Muhammad reduced, rejected the proposal of Abu and Omar simply under the pretext of young age while he wanted to marry her to Ali because he liked Ali better. It's kind of weird that he would use an excuse. I mean, I don't even get how that makes sense. I mean, let's say you want someone else to marry your daughter. You can just tell them that there's someone else I have in mind. Why would you say... She's too young for you, man. Get out of here, you dirty old... <laughs> no, you didn't say that. <laughs> that would... Yeah, Uthman. Yeah, not Uthman. Sorry. Yeah, Abu Bakr. Get out, you old horny man. Get out of my house. Do not look at my daughter ever again. I will beat you with the beatings. You will never see the beatings again. Never come to my house. Look at my daughter that way again. I will kick your ass. <laughs> I mean, that's basically... He didn't say it. Yeah. That's basically what he said, right? But, you know, according, apparently what he meant was, no, 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 I have someone else in mind for her. So you guys stay away from my daughter. <laughs> there's there's actually these hadith where this is what Ali did. Ali decided to go to, I believe, the daughters of Abu Jahal and propose to them to get married to them while he was married to Fatima. And Fatima got mad and she ran to Muhammad and being like, yo, this guy is about to marry the daughters of your biggest enemy. What is going on? So then Muhammad got mad and he gave us, he went on the pulpit and he was saying, I won't let this happen. And he repeated this like three, four times. And he cut the marriage off and threatened Ali. If you marry that guy's daughter, you divorce my daughter. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to find the hadith I posted about it. 
he has different standards for his own daughter and for himself. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. He wouldn't let he would marry like you know, 18 women in total himself and have multiple sex slaves, but for Ali, no, you can't marry other than my own, <laughs> no my own daughter. Yeah. Classic culture. Classic. Hey, that's an interesting point that he didn't give um they uh, Fatima came to to uh, complain that she had too much work and he wouldn't give any slaves to her, to her maybe that was the reason he didn't want ali to sleep with the slaves <laughs> i don't know <laughs> the slaves the islamic slaves are uh, not just they're not just housemates they also um you also have sex with them so yeah it's a yeah, two they're also bedmates yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh found it <laughs> all right <laughs> Uh, shall we just share the screen quickly? Oh, this is interesting. After Fatima's death, Ali had four wives. <laughs> and so oh, yeah, he went on a he went on a charade. Like he went crazy. Him and uh, he married like twenty five women according to some Shias, man, after Fatima. Twenty five, yeah. And Hassan and Hussein, one of them, they were like 200. One is like 70 women. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ali had four wives and 17 sex. How wives. you cannot keep track of all of that? Okay, so this is the this is the one. The chapter is called the chapter of jealousy. <laughs> so Ali proposed to the daughter of Abu Jahal when he was married to Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet. When Fatima heard of that, she went to the Prophet and said, Your people are saying that you do not feel angry for your daughters. This Ali is going to marry the daughter of Abu Jahl. Miswar said, The Prophet stood up and I heard him when he bore witness, say the Shahada. Then he said, I married my daughter Zainab to this guy and he spoke to me. Fatima is a part of me and I hate to see her face with troubles. By Allah, the daughter of the messenger of Allah and the daughter of the enemy of Allah will never be joined together in marriage to one man. So he said so. Ali abandoned the marriage proposal. So this is a classic case of Muhammad basically, or you'd say cock blocking Ali. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> why didn't he just understand i mean I, I mean i know why but i mean this is a perfect example of how <sighs> this is a perfect example of why you know you need the the leader needs to follow the same thing that he's preaching exactly like, islam you know you know um christianity has its issues but th it doesn't have this issue because there's only one man one wife right you have a marriage between a man and a woman. Women are much better off in that situation. Women, of course, the world, you cannot divorce thing is a big problem. But the fact that it's one man, when one woman, that actually works out a lot better for women. Tends to, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would rather just have one okay. husband and no co-wives. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking news. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll continue. <laughs> so this part is, I'm just going to give an introduction about this book. So Maulana Ashraf Ali Thanvi, huge scholar in the subcontinent, and this book called Bahishte Zewar is super, super popular and is given to young brides when they get married to read a uh, classical manual of Islamic sacred law, right? And I will just just a trigger warning you can see it on the screen it's it's the stuff they write in these books is is like seriously sometimes what the f were you guys thinking and it's very graphic so if you don't like to hear it i would say just be aware trigger warning uh you will read that yeah i'll read that one um, the part of like the first part's not on it, so i'll go over there um if a woman is underage but not so small that if one has intercourse with her, there is a fear of the vaginal tissues tearing to such an extent that the vagina and the anus will virtually come together. Then by the insertion of the gland of the penis into her 
vagina, Rachel will become fard on the man if he has reached the age of puberty. However, if there is the aforementioned fear in a very minor girl, then the mere insertion of the penis does not render Rachel uh, obligatory. Whoa. Okay. So Gusel is uh, the bath that you have to take after sex. So, of course, yeah. discussing this as if like it's just like day to day routine. If you're having sex with a little child, and this happens, then you don't have to you don't have to take a bath like the classical yeah, so, Islamic law book. <laughs> no, like so, if her vagina rips into her anus, you don't have to take a shower. That's called uh, what is that called when it happens? Septu Septula? I have no idea, but that happens to grown women when they give birth. I think it's, I forget what, there's a, it's not septula, but it's a, it's a similar word to that, where it happens to young, it happens to a lot of African women, actually. Um, this thing where this happens and they, be, they lose the ability to hold in the feces. And then a lot of these young women, they, they're forced to go live in an outhouse or something like that because the womb wasn't big enough to deliver the baby. And a lot of times the baby will yeah. even die. They'll have a miscarriage, yeah. and um, you know all of these bad things will happen to them. All because there's no medical intervention over there. There's no, they're having you know they're having babies young before the hips are wide enough, and then there's no um, C sections, right? Yeah. Well, so this called- happens like in Canada, in our hospitals, women are tearing while they're giving birth. It yeah. happens all the time to yeah. grown women. Yeah, but this one so, specifically it says uh, the vagina and, and uh, penis come together. Sorry, yeah. and the anus come together. That's called a fi- fistula. That's what it's called. That was the word I was oh, looking yeah. for. Not septula, fistula. So this is a common issue that happens especially to young girls. Now, Islam, yeah. Islam is from the creator of the universe. Why is, and Muhammad is a mercy to all mankind. Shouldn't Muhammad be the mercy to little girls as well? Like That's my question. Shouldn't Muhammad be a mercy to little girls? Because apparently this this issue is causing harm on a lot of young women in the world. And Abdullah Gondal, like I know this is this is very big in the Desi community. This book, right? Like I never read this book. It's very very popular. I mean, if you I'll just Google Malana Ashraf for you, Tanvi, like he's famous. I don't even know how many books this guy wrote, but like he they have like Rahmatullah Alayhi next to his name, like. Yeah, he was born in 1863 and he died in 1943. And I'm just reading his uh, his wiki page and I don't even... Okay. Yeah, so his, he's written about 345 books. Wow. And the total number of publications attributed to him, his own writings, transcription of his speeches and letters mm-hmm. is over a thousand. Damn. Wow. Um, oh. Okay. Hmm. Let me read a comment, a nice comment. I did some research about the Bashiti Zawar reference. It turns out the Zuling isn't unique to a Diabandi school. Ahmed Raza Khan was a founder of Bralvi Hanafi school, said the same thing. Yeah. So there's these two big schools in, in the subcontinent, the Bralvi schools from Bareilly Sharif is a region in India. They're like the, the green turban, grave worshipper, dancing Sufi Baba Milad people. And then the Diabandis are more like they're both Hanafis, your students, but they're different theological matters. And the Ubanis are more like the Salafi leaning Hanafis, you could call them, kind of. They don't do the Rafa'i al but they do most of the things that the Salafis do. <laughs> like just very small. Rafa'i al is when you raise your hands in prayer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I really want to read the rest of them. They're kind of. Uh... Yeah, yeah the, they're really intense. The next one will just show when not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. favorite oh. friends here. <laughs> so funny that I remember this happened a while back. And this is the problem what we're talking about. Because Muhammad married that, not only is this guy, this guy is saying these things because of his prophet and all the books, his classical scholars that have asserted these things. And we got to talk about what here consent, because he's trying to say that if a child is given away by his parents, it's not rape because the parents consented on behalf of the child. Yeah, that's not how consent works. That's not how pe- like parental consent works. You can, 
absolutely uh, give parental consent for, for things. Um, uh, marriage and sex is not one of them. Um, so to give consent, you have to have a proper knowledge and life experiences to to know what you're getting yourself into, to know what, I don't think many six-year-olds know what sex is or nine-year-olds what it is. Um, even at that time, children are not, they cannot consent to something like that um, because their brains are not developed enough to <clears throat> just don't understand. understand the full spectrum of what's going to happen. Um, and it's, it's still child rape. You're just consenting to your child being raped. It's yeah. I, and I think this is an important point that he's not purposely not getting because he doesn't, because if he did get it, then he'd have to admit that Muhammad with a child was raped. That, that's a problem, right? Um, yeah. even if I don't technically, you know, consider him to be a pedophile because I don't think that's what he was. In this case, this is this is rape because he's with a child, and you know, for him to admit that, would have to he'd have to admit that Muhammad basically was involved in rape, right? So, and and you can rape a wife too. It doesn't have to be um, and any child, any child that you know that you're having sex with. Obviously, we all agree that that's not it's not right because they don't understand what what they're getting into. They don't understand the, ch the children, right? They don't know, like you were just saying, right, Alex, that we don't. They don't understand it so you basically consent is meaningless because they wouldn't they wouldn't as a child they don't get that's why it's illegal to have sex with a child in yeah. it's illegal because we protect children right we we're keeping them and now of course if there's two young children and they they're doing it themselves that's different than a, an old man even a young man any man or usually men it could be women sometimes it's women too but like with the child, right? The child, it's it's that's the problem, right? They, they, there's an imbalance of power. There's an imbalance exactly. of collision. You know, obviously, a child, you can, you have to protect your children, right? So that's why it's wrong. Uh, I think he doesn't really understand, or he doesn't want to understand it. <laughs> Level <Well, laughs> parental consent. <laughs> it's, I don't know. It's like sex with PG rated yeah, and parental yeah. guidance. Marriage and sex is not PG. <laughs> Like, I, it's just no way a child can consent. And it's like, the thing is, it's not just him, it's the big scholars that say this, it's Imam Bukhari that said it, it's the Alliance of the Traveler mm -hmm. author who said it. And we'll see that there's a lot more scholars that are going to say, but before we get to the scholars, we have some videos just to show you, firstly, from Ali Dava. Which makes me so, so uncomfortable. <laughs> it... <clears throat> Yeah, I hate that video so much. We're going to watch it for the sake of the audience. So this is Ali Dawa admitting to marrying his own nine-year-old daughter to an old man. No, no, no. If my daughter, 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 if my if so, um, uh, I I started my menstruations at nine years old. I can guarantee you, I was not ready for marriage at nine years old. Um, I I work with children around that age of nine, and if I have to, I have to remind them like four times an hour to tie their shoes. They're not ready to to be married to have a relationship. It's I yeah. After seeing that clip of Ali Dawa, like I didn't have like much respect, but after that, I was no like it makes me nauseous just to think about him. The question I would ask right now to anybody like would Ali Dawa in his right mind ever defend this had it not been for Islam? Would he ever, would anybody, unless it's associated with this kind of... Even during his club days. <laughs> like, the only re reason he's been pushed to say these things is not because he thinks it's probably, it probably doesn't sit well with his own conscience either. I hope so, at least. 
It's mostly because his prophet said it, and now he's stuck with this whole idea of this perfect man, and now he has to live for the best example for all times to come. Mm -hmm. And if he says that, oh, back then it was okay that girls were like, you know, maturing early, or well, we can find relative, relevant examples today, and even still, he doesn't understand the difference and says that even today he'd marry a nine year old child to a 50 year old man or whatever his own daughter like i hope i don't know if he has kids or not but oh that's that's a hard thing to say if you have kids like i, I cannot imagine yeah i think i think what i was gonna say was i don't know what he was thinking but i i think unfortunately there's there's two directions that one can go in a situation like this one can either go towards that you know this is actually that was that time you know that was that uh, that was an exception that was limited or one can just go like nuts like him and say no 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 it's fine it's okay <laughs> whatever it's you know it's perfectly fine even i would marry my daughter too you know like he's he's obviously not he's probably not telling the truth i don't think he would actually do that he's he's saying something really stupid in order to defend like you said in order to defend islam because he's stuck right and that's a great question i i love that question because i think if you actually asked him that question would you actually defend this if it wasn't part of islam might be a tough question for them to answer because it is part of islam so they'll probably say yes but if you came up with something like you'd have to find a way to trick them into mm. answering that yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, the next video we have another a video from uh the master he did a fantastic 20 minute clip uh on this whole thing we're gonna show some snippets from his thing uh but uh yeah watch this one and enjoy i'll come back to you after this one's really يعني رضيعة يعني إذا مين ما تبناها سواء زوجها أو انظر التشريع الإسلامي نعم أنا ما أنا أنا يستطيع أن يتزوج من رضيعة هذا ما قلته دكتور أحمد نعم صح يعني أنا بأتكلم عن هذا وبقول يعني نحن مركزين على النقطة دي لا هي نقطة جزئية بسيطة جدا نعم. يعني ولكن أثار جدل كبير ورجل قال لك البنت عندها تسع سنين تعاشر أحسن من عندها عشرين واحنا مين بن مختلفين في سن الزواج ورفع سن الزواج نرفعه ولا ما نرفعوش؟ الوضع ده ايه؟ تسع سنين تنفع؟ هو الراجل ده بي بيتكلم كلام هو اولا ليس هناك في الشرع تحديد لسن الزواج. على طول كده ليس هناك في الشرع تحديد لسن الزواج يعني ولكن اللي فهمته كده اللي فهمته كده انك موافق نعم انت بتأيد الفتوى دي مش بأيد الفتوى دي امال ايه؟ ده ده مش بأيد الفتوى دي يعني تسع سنين انت انت ان تحتمل الزوج يعني تحتمل المعاشره تحتمل الزوج تحتمل البنت الزواج. تحتمل الزواج من عندها كام سنه؟ نعم انا ما اعرفش بقى ما هو ما هو في عندها شفته في عندها هقول لسيادتك الجدات عندها عند 15 سنه ومقروضه قد كده هو وما تنفعش الحاجه وما تعرفش حاجه في واحده عندها 10 سنين وتلاقيها بسم الله ما شاء الله قد الحيط <تصفيق> مثلا <تصفيق> هي العمليه بتتوقف عليها <تصفيق> مش مرتبطه بسن مش مرتبط الشرع لم يعني يعني البنت البنت عندها تسع سنين وقد الحيطه تنفع تتجوز؟ <تصفيق> طب اكيد تصلوا بينا على 91 235 اصل انا مش في مود مناقشتك النهارده تسع سنين وتتجوز ده تسع سنين وتتجوز اذا اذا يعني ايوه ما هي بعض الاعضاء اللي حاولوا يلتفوا حول تفكير موضوع زواج الاطفال الصغيرات سن وان هو كان اكثر صراحه لدرجه ان هو قال كمان ما اشترطش سن البلوغ ده حتى يعني فسر الايه الكريمه لمن لم تحب بعد يعني ممكن في اي سن ان شاء الله ثلاث سنين طالما بامكانها انها يعني تطيق طب ايه تفسيرها عندك يا دكتور؟ معلش انا عايز تفسير الايه عندك يا دكتور ثاني اكمل يا دكتور ليه؟ لي تفسير عند اي عالم من اهل العلم في الايه، انا بقول ايه من كلام الله حضرتك قلت والتي لم تحب اه ما انا بتكلم على ايه مش بتكلم على انا ده انا بقول رقان الله ما انا عارفه حضرتك ما انا بقول حضرتك ما تقولوش تفسير اصل انا ما فسرتش طيب طيب ده ربنا اللي بيقول ولا ايه اللي انتوا معتقدين صحتها ولا مش مش معتقدين صحتها؟ معتقدين القران ولا مش معتقدين القران؟ ده ده معناه في اي سن يا دكتور ياسر مش شرط كمان سن البلوغ يعني انا بقول لحضرتك انت مقتنعه بالقران ولا لا؟ 
Um, <laughs> more culture. I was gonna say, like, it's interesting that there's actually those are Muslims arguing with those sheikhs, Egyptians, eh? Egyptian Muslims. Mm -hmm. Muslim, I mean, probably. Um, but like, it does show that even Muslims, like, are troubled by this, right? Some Muslims are troubled by this because it's <laughs> it's bad, right? <laughs> like, it's, it's yeah, because they're better than Islam. Exactly. <laughs> and the whole idea of the last two guys being stuck because of Islam, you're only defending this. The guys just explicitly like, I, this is not an opinion. It's just what yeah, God are you says. Are you Muslim? So basically, he's like, if you don't accept marrying children is okay, you're not Muslim. But this is what it ends up being because you're practically rejecting the Quran and what. <laughs> it's appeal to authority. Right? And I mean, exactly. he has a point. I mean, it's a good point that, like, I mean, it's it's basically an undefeatable point because you you're coining the other person. You've gone away from right and wrong to that's what the Quran says. That's what the Quran says. Yeah, but but no, no, that's what the Quran says. Do you do you accept the Quran? Do you like the Quran? Are you Muslim? Like you know, you, what is that person gonna say? Like you, he's won the argument no matter what because mm -hmm. it's not a fair mm -hmm. argument. He's he's thrown it into a personal basically a personal interrogation like you know how dare you question the quran like how can you question that um and of course i think if he was talking to like someone like mufti abu Layth, now that would be interesting to see like him come back with something else right no i'm not questioning the quran how dare you insult the prophet and say he married a child you know you know that's what he would say like he would, he would my favorite oh. my favorite <laughs> he would let come Right? He would say, "No, I'm I'm defending Islam. You guys are ru ruining Islam." <laughs> Which, of course, to me as a, as an non-Muslim, I'm just like, "Okay, I appreciate that, even though I don't think it's yeah. like it's not a strong. I, like I don't I don't know how you, I don't know how he's defending that, but but you know he has his ways. So you know, kudos to him, and you know, all support to him. <laughs> I love his so Islam. gymnastics is real. I love it. Let's just say he's one flexible mufti. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. oh man! But yeah, I'm just reading some of the comments, uh, and yeah, it's it's actually just it's an indefensible idea. Like the, the what the sheikhs were saying, the the, the video we watched, Ali Dava, the Farid thing, and there's no defense to this. Like no matter what way you try to spin it. You have to admit that because of Muhammad's stupid action, this is now an issue 14 centuries later. And we can show you innumerable cases that happened to this day in Yemen, I believe I saw where a young bride died because her husband was, what, 30 and she was 12. And our 112-year-old <laughs> guy married like an 18-year-old lady. They, these cases happen all the time and they justify it using this exact thing like if if you go in a pakistani village i have literally literally seen this justification heard in my from my very own ears that the prophet married this so as soon as you were back in villages where i'm from in pakistan you don't send women to school in certain families and as soon as they're of age you just marry them off you know like in certain villagers use Muhammad's example to justify it. So there are real life consequences to this day. And yeah, religion is a contributing factor. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, this is one example for sure, which is sort of Muhammad's blind spot. Like, again, being, you know, that wasn't even an issue back then in that era, in that culture, whatever. It was just a common thing. They married children. Maybe not that extreme of an example as we've now shown. And it's not, it wasn't universal. For example, you know, Muhammad's companions, he, he told them, you're too old for my daughter. So that was that was acceptable to say that. But again, it still was also acceptable to marry a child if, you know, you wanted to. Um, but what I, what I wanted to say is that, oh man, I forgot my point. Uh, what was I saying? I forgot. Okay, never mind. I'm tired. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> okay, next slide. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. oh no! There we go. <laughs> it forced me to play the videos. 
Right. Oh yeah, Let's I remember. I, I remember. I remember. What I was gonna say was, okay, so there's a whole thing with Aisha and how this happened, and you know, it was part of the, kind of like maybe not that common, but it was acceptable. But as the whole thing with the whole thing with Zainab, now that was going out of the way to make a special clause just for him to marry his adopted son's ex-wife, and he destroyed adoption forever. Just mm-hmm. as he wanted to marry Zainab. Now that's like as bad as an example as you can get of how religion is messing up, like messed up the world and messed up the like life for adopted kids in Islam. You cannot adopt, mm-hmm. you cannot take the name of and and before Islam, people would take even Muhammad adopted his, you know, um Osama and right, bin Harissa. Did, you know. Mm-hmm. Um so like that's like an even worse example in my opinion. This whole child marriage thing for sure is terrible and awful because Muhammad is being held as, only because Muhammad is being held as an example for all time. But especially with Zainab, it's even more extreme of an example of his own selfish needs, like screwing over basically all of these generations to come, right? Which is again, why it's so important that we talk about these things because we need people to see that this is not a good thing, right? Yeah, so, yeah. How merciful to orphans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I apologize for interrupting you. Oh, no, no. I came back. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is the point which they keep bringing back. The number one thing the apologists will bring up, Islamic defenders, tell the future feuders, is that back in the day it was okay to marry young kids. In fact, it was okay to marry a six-year-old or a nine-year-old. But when you actually look into the claim, they're just straight up lying to your face. Because, no, it's not the case. People, even back then, realized that marrying kids too young is dangerous and will lead them to dying more. Despite there being infancy death and infancy mortality high and we needing to have more kids at a younger age, and that, you know, like, life expectancy wasn't as high as it is now, they still understood that we have to take into consideration minimum age because going too young is too dangerous, right? And if you can see on the left side, it says that uh, <clears throat> in ancient Egypt, so this is way before Islam, like thousands of years, I believe, before Islam. And it says that girls were married as young as 12 and boys as 15, although the average age seems to have been 14 for girls and 18 to 20 for boys. That's still, a f- that's the same region. Ancient Egypt is the same Arabian kind of era. And it's also, guess what? A very hot climate, allegedly where women are supposed to mature younger as for the Islamic. <laughs> you understand yeah. how bad the argument is. Yeah. And they said also people die younger too, right? Which apparently a worker with man. Muhammad, it's all in the 60s, but apparently <laughs> oh, we didn't live that long back then, right? So you had to get married young. Um, I I want to point out something though. This is this is a civilization, right? We're talking about civilization. So like let's let's compare the two. The middle where Muhammad was, it wasn't a civilization. It was just a bunch of nomads and a bunch of tribes that were not, you know, until Muhammad united them. It wasn't like the Persians or the Romans. Those were empires. Those were known as empires until the Islamic empire started, you know, from Muhammad's time. But that's, that also probably explains why some of these laws that you have that are either the laws or, you know, there was no government, right, in Arabia. People would take advantage. They would rob each other and steal. And all of these things were not, they, you know, until the actual civilization actually grew into a civilization, there probably wasn't any of these laws. You know what I mean? That's probably why it was considered okay back then in that place because there was no civilization. There was just, it was a wild west, right? People <laughs> yeah. west of Arabia. <laughs> Anyone that was um, like a foreigner that came into Arabia could be cheated and, you know, um, all of that stuff, right? All of that terrible stuff. Yeah. And like Arabia at that time was in the backwards of the world, you know, like the Romans and the Byzantines, nobody really cared about Arabia, you know. <laughs> like it wasn't that famous in the sixth century and whatnot. Yeah. But keeping in mind again, like in ancient Rome, the next example we see, 
the minimum legal age for a girl to be married was 12 and for a boy 15 but most men married later around the age of 26 this was because males were thought to be mentally unbalanced between the ages of 15 and 25 <laughs> Which I think is still true to this day. Yeah, <laughs> this is ancient Rome. So again, years before Muhammad. And they had such a different understanding. And this also goes to show that the, the, the idea and the concept of marriage and stuff is very cultural. But even though despite different cultures, these major civilizations, thousands of years before Islam, still identified the need to protect children and set minimum ages. Yeah, yeah. They I guess they were smarter they were than Vulnerable people that needed to be protected. And on the right side, uh, we have uh, changes of marriage in ancient China. And this is actually a PubMed article I found. It's an academic article which says that the change in age of marriage in ancient China can be classified into three periods. So this guy's talking about 680 BC. 680 BC is what a thousand years before Islam, if not. Yeah. Oh, more. More. 13. And they said the age of marriage at 20 for men and at 15 for women. Even though it was written in the works of Confucian school that men should marry at 30 and women at 20. Then uh, there was an issue where to encourage childbirth. The government reduced the age of marriage to 15 for men and 13 for women, but they still didn't drop as low as you'd expect them, you know, like six or nine or prepubescent. And, and then in the last phase, it says from the Song to the Qing dynasties, the age of marriage was set at 16 for men and at 14 for women in ancient times. So this is like three, four different civilizations. The Egyptian was kind of like that same area. Then there's ancient Rome. And then we have different Chinese civilizations spanning a thousand years. And they all unanimously are, the minimum we saw was 12. It's all 12 and up. The averages are 15, 16. One is saying 20 is the average. The recommendation is 20 and 30 in ancient China. So the whole idea that, oh, it was super common back in the day that, you know, we are going to marry young kids. Okay, even if you consider, given for the argument's sake, that you want to have more kids, like it, it, <clears throat> it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> it doesn't, it's still abuse. It's Why still... would you marry a 50 year old to a yeah, nine year old? That's sense. not. It's, it doesn't make sense because they're more likely to die in childbirth if they're that young, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no C section, mm -hmm. there's no medical intervention. It's, it's risky, right? So, unless you don't care you about during intercourse as well so. yeah true mm -hmm. another interesting detail is aisha never had a child she never got pregnant mm -hmm. and he she was his favorite and his favorite wife too so that's just an interesting side note <laughs> he didn't have uh children with any of his wives except khadija right i think he had one with the maria the slave girl ibrahim yeah but he died. Yeah, he died too. And it's interesting how the things that happened to Muhammad ended up becoming the theology. So mm -hmm. he's not going to have any, any male children because he's a prophet, right? But he can have female children. <laughs> Makes sense. It Makes sense. Exactly. <laughs> Shall I go okay, next slide? Well, yeah, next slide. And I think this is a very triggering slide because this tells you the story of the day Aisha got married and it's just sad and I'll uh, I'll let San, uh, Alex read it all right <clears throat> let's start on the left side um Allah's messenger married me when I was six years old and I was admitted to his house when I was nine she further said we went to Medina and I had a an attack of fever for a month and my hair had come down to my earlobes. Uh, my mother came to me and I was at that time on a swing along with my playmates. She called me loudly and I went to her 
and I did not know what she wanted from me. She took a hold of my hand and took me to the door. Um, and as I was saying, ha, ha, as if I was gasping, until the agitation of my heart was over. She took me to a house where I had gathered the women of the Ansar. They all blessed me and wished me good luck and said, may you have sharing, yeah, may you have sharing good. She, my mother, entrusted me to them. They washed my head and embellished me and nothing, nothing frightened me. Allah's messenger came in there in the morning and I was entrusted to him. That's it's a, it's a sad, sad little tale. Like Aisha is nine and she's playing on the swings and with her friends' children. They're like, what, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. And suddenly her mom grabs her and Aisha has no clue what's going on. Takes her to her house and then she's just bewildered and amazed, kind of confused. She's breathless and then suddenly... Has a panic attack, basically. Yeah, and she's just cleaned up and given away to Muhammad the next day. It's that's how it happened. That's the day she got married. She I don't know if she even had a Valima or not, eh? Good question. A couple of years yeah. it was consum after the consummation, they probably did. I'm I trying to recall if I remember that there was some bread some meat and bread being given out. I don't know if that was for this I I vaguely remember the hadith, but I don't know now. Hmm. How uncomfortable is that, though? Like, everybody knows when you consummated your marriage. Like, that's not... Yeah, right? That's not, like, information you want out yeah, there. Yeah, this is something interesting. Like, how many of the other wives of Muhammad do you find that, oh, he consummated the marriage, like, this age or that age, or with such right precise away. details? <laughs> I guess there's one or two, but like Aisha is like, yeah, I was six and nine, six and nine. <laughs> like it's... I remember. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that is interesting, actually. But I think, uh, Alex, you were saying even like the fact that you have the Walima after it's consummated is kind of weird, right? Yeah. I mean, why would you celebrate the fact that you're having sex? Like, well, especially <laughs> with a child, but like you just. Like now it's official, guys. We've we fucked. Like <laughs> that's none of your business. Like even it's, like two adults. Like well, fine. even yeah. When they would have sex, like right after the wedding ceremony, and have sex, and then there would have to have blood on the sheets and stuff. That's weird too. Um, you would yeah, have it's weird culture. Yeah, in so many yeah, places, yeah, and like medieval England. Um, you'd have like the whole royal court watch you consummate your marriage. Yeah, that was just stop yeah. doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just so don't weird. do that anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> so this brings us to the closing end of our presentation. Uh, we have just one more video. It's gonna be a little bit of the masked Arab. Uh, very very disturbing. Trigger warning again. Um very graphic again we all stand against child molestation you have to save the children against any form of violence and sexual violence be it religious disguised or not uh but yeah just watch it and we'll come back and we'll discuss what we just heard it's quite a lot marriage in sharia Let's pick up Fath al-Bari, an exegesis of Sahih Bukhari, volume 11, page 25. It says, Muslim schools of jurisprudence unanimously allow the marriage of young girls, even if they were still babies in the cradle. But intercourse cannot occur until the girl can withstand penetration. That was just a quote I read. This clearly tells us that a Muslim man can marry a baby girl within Sharia law, but cannot have vaginal intercourse with her unless she can withstand it. This rule is universal for the four Sunni schools of thought. The Shia Jafari school of thought also has no minimum age for marriage, but sets the <coughs> age at which sexual intercourse can occur at a minimum of nine lunar years. It must be noted here that barring intercourse, all types of sexual pleasure can take place with any girl, even babies. Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini spells this out very clearly in his book, Tahrir al-Wasila, 
volume 2 page 216 that a man can carry out all the sexual pleasures he desires on his bride even if she was a baby he is entitled to thigh her that is placing the penis between the thighs of the baby heavily kiss the child grope her body with sexual lust and so on they cannot, however, have sex with her until she is nine, according to Shia Islam. But with Sunni Islam, there is no minimum age for sex, so long as the child can withstand intercourse. Next, we move on to when the time comes for a girl to withstand intercourse is determined. Let's turn to the commentary for Sahih Muslim called Sharh Muslim, volume 3, page 577. We see here that all the Sunni schools of thought agree that if the girl's father and the husband both agree that the girl is ready for intercourse, the man can have intercourse with her regardless of age. Just think about that for a second. We're now talking about consent as well, and the girl has no consent here whatsoever. The matter is firmly between the father and her husband. The girl has no option. In fact, she could even be too young to speak, as there is no minimum age limit for marriage. The only time a girl can give her opinion is if she is married after she has already hit puberty. If there is disagreement between the girl's father and the husband over whether a girl is able to withstand intercourse, according to the Hanbali sect, the girl waits until she is nine years old before being forced to join her husband regardless of what she or her father think. This is purely rape. As I explained already, there is no minimum age for intercourse with a small girl in Sunni Islam. Scholars, however, have said in Radd al-Muhtar, volume 5, page 283, the following. Intercourse is not limited to any age. For example, a fat young girl can withstand penetration at a very young age. <coughs> Jesus. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with the Shia one either. That's interesting. Um, Man, that was nuts. Yeah, the it seems like the religion doesn't really protect um, women at all. It's not at all feminist. It's not at all beneficial to women's rights, little girls' rights, um, adult women's rights, anyone's. Basically, it's all it's all about men. Right? It's all about Muhammad. it's all about Muhammad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and like, it's so much sex in this thing. Like, I don't get it. Like. You're raping kids, you're marrying a six-year-old child or a nine-year-old, you have like 18 wives and then you have sex slaves and then you still can't stop your sexual urges that they prickle into heaven and you have throttles with hoodies with big perky tits and the Quran verse says <laughs> that believers will be busy you deflowering virgins. Like, what is going on? I can't wait to get mine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, um, I think that that was a great presentation. Uh, thank you for putting it for to both of you for putting it together. And uh, those relevant clips were excellent, of course. Um, is there any anything else you want to add? So I think we've we've basically made it like super clear that this Aisha wasn't Aisha wasn't in a good situation. And um, yes, she, there was she had some benefits being the favorite wife of Muhammad and, you know, Comparatively speaking, if she was married to a husband that didn't have other co-wives, she would have been better off, I think, you know, with one husband not, you know, having to share her time with, you know, so many other wives, you know, have to worry about a husband constantly getting another woman, getting another woman. And, you know, the fact that she was married as a child, the fact that there's so much evidence from from the Hadith, not just from the six and nine Hadith, but all the other hadith that you put together that show that she was a child in every regard of it. Even Imam Bukhari made, you know, understood that, um, you know, the Tabari understood that. Everyone basically understood that. I mean, it's only now that things are suddenly looked at differently. But um, do you want to add anything else to this um, before we end it? Um. <clears throat> The only other thing I'll add is that a lot of people need to understand that there is a thing called child grooming that happens, that people who are victims of this kind of manipulation not always give us the direct signals. In fact, they don't mostly sometimes even understand they are being manipulated or being violated, especially if you've been living with the violator since a very, very young age. <clears throat> so you end up what we call is a Stockholm syndrome kind of situation. And I believe a lot of Muslims don't realize that when they talk about Aisha or children being married off or slavery or the right or consent of slaves, where people need to understand that it's not just what is said on the outside that matters. 
if a slave says yes to doing something with you, is it a meaningful consent? Does that consent have any value to it because of the power dynamic involved in the relationship, right? And this is something that is lost upon a lot of people. And to understand this, I keep recommending this one show, The Hands Made Tale. It is for Muslims to watch this so you can actually put yourself in the shoes of these slaves who will say, yes, sir, bismillah, salam alaikum. But it's not that straightforward. You want to say any closing remarks about this? Yeah, well, just to say on that, like, I mean, if everybody was accepting the abuse that she was receiving, right, that Muhammad was giving her, what else was she supposed to do? She just accept it and go on with her life. Like, she can't, there's nobody she can turn to, really, to help her out of this. What are we supposed to do, leave Islam? (laughs) That's a good point. I mean, I that's what I was trying. I was having a debate with some Muslims on Twitter some time ago, and they always say, like, some of them say things like, "Yeah, well, she could have just left him." Really, a little kid like that leaving her? Go where? There's hadith where Abu Bakr hit her because she made Muhammad. Her. Yeah, and Omar hit Hafsa. It's Hafsa because <laughs> where, where do you where do you want her to go? She's what she's gonna join the Romans. She's gonna go on a journey by herself, and like, what, what do you expect? Like. And what, what better option did she have? She was already the favorite wife of Muhammad. So she was, you know, the, the cult leader's favorite wife. That's better than just being some random alone woman leaving in the desert going. I mean, she had no choice. The world society, Medina, was all Muslims. None yeah. of them, the wives of the Prophet, really had a choice, to be honest. This isn't, there's no feminism back then. There was no women's rights back then. Like women, they needed a man. To protect them and they needed a tribe and they that world cultural system didn't give them a lot of power didn't give them a lot of options right the other option is you end up being someone else's slave right you go out in the desert take your risk and you end up being captured in someone else's slave so it's not really like you have a lot of options um and alex thank you for joining it was a thank you for your contribution it was actually interesting to have you know you on the show and uh you know your first time on uh, the channel, first time talking about this stuff, it's great. Um, you're most welcome to come again. We can talk about more stuff, maybe specifically even go to your story. We, we know all about Abdullah Gondal. We've talked tons yeah. of, we don't know too much about your journey and how you ended up where you are now, how you got into Islam. Yeah, definitely. Today. Uh, but maybe in the future, at some point, we can go to your entire story. In, yeah, in, definitely. Um, and as well, I have linked to your Twitter. Uh, so her Twitter is there in the, all of her Twitters are there. And um, Abdullah Gondal and uh, Alex don't have a channel, but for now you can check out Twitter and or Facebook. You can find them on Facebook as well. But I think Twitter is the main platform that they're using at the moment. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so and, I, uh, you want to add anything else? About Aisha. Uh, I just want to show, I found that hadith about the Aisha being slapped and the Omar <laughs> slapping Hafsa. So the whole story goes that uh, Muhammad was at home and then Omar and Abu Bakr saw a group of people and they were like, what the hell is going on, right? And they go inside and then Muhammad's like uh, laughing saying, look, they're around me. They're asking for extra money. So Abu Bakr gets up, went to Aisha and slapped her on the neck. And then Omar got up and slapped his daughter on the neck. And then both of them said, are you asking God's messenger for what he does not possess? <laughs> so, <Wow. laughs> yeah. And then after that, it says that there was this huge drama there after he withdrew from them for a whole month. And long story short, people thought Muhammad divorced his wife for a whole month. And then Allah used the Quran to blackmail them into obedience. If they don't listen to Muhammad, they can leave him, but <laughs> they will go, go to hell um, and double the punishment. Where? Yeah. So. Go where? Hell. That's where. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what happened. Then. Where women belong. With, <laughs> with that, uh, we will continue this Aisha series because Muslims think that it was all happy sailing and. Uh, Aisha was always happy, but no, there are all sorts of ups and downs, uh, and there's trust issues, lots of trust issues. In fact, uh, Aisha was uh, propagating breastfeeding adults, and then Muhammad would find men alone with Aisha, and 
he'd be like, who the hell is this dude? What is he doing at my house? And then Aisha's like, oh, don't worry. He's just my one of my foster brothers. He's my foster brother. And we Muhammad, hang out. <laughs> Muhammad would get super angry. So there's a lot of drama that Aisha was involved in. And then she, and there's a lot more to uncover. Lots of uh, wife jealousy tales. Lots, lots of, of scandals. Lots of scandals. Lots of controversy upcoming in this series of Aisha. So you'll learn a lot about Muhammad, but this is the whole point. Learn about Muhammad, but through the perspective or lens of other people around him. Like when Aisha is saying, oh yeah, like, it seems like your Lord is really fast in fulfilling your desires when it comes to marrying the slaves. So you kind of get a completely different perspective on why she's taunting him, right? Yeah. And there's some one, one hadith just before we close off. It's like Aisha would wake up at the night and suddenly won't find Muhammad. And her first instinct would be, she got scared and Muhammad ran off to one of his other slave girls. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, lots of this kind of drama is going to show up. Like, I mean, Aisha poisoning Muhammad to that is kind of a huge claim of the she has to say and whatnot. But until next time, that is all from my side. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. And uh, do subscribe to the channel if you're new here. Uh, link is below, and if you want to support the show, there's a link as well in the description. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week or the week after. We'll try to do it as soon as possible. I apologize for delaying it last week. Uh, and But hopefully we'll try to do it, if possible, once a week. If not, it'll be once every two weeks, so we'll keep doing this. And uh, that's that. Uh, have a good night, everyone who is in our time zone, and good morning to the rest of you. Uh, bye for now. <laughs>